Lamentations chapter number three, and I begin reading in there just just one moment. I want to read you a verse before I get to Lamentations, and you don't have to turn there. I just want to read it to you. Deuteronomy 4.29, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. So we're talking about getting a clear view of God, who God is, his character, his attributes. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, if we seek the Lord, thou shalt find him. So if you want to get a clear picture of who God is, God doesn't play games like hide and go seek. And so if you really want to know his character, how he responds, how he performs, who he is, we can know according to the word of God. He's not going to keep it from us. And for those who have a desire to know, and that really separates the men from the boys, is those who have a desire to know um, God and to know what he's like and, and really an, on an intimate level how he responds and how we're supposed to respond to him. We've talked about God's love. We've talked about this morning his mercy and tonight, of course, about his faithfulness. And his faithfulness is directly tied to your faithfulness. If you don't believe God is faithful, you won't be faithful. Just like, you know, we say, well, I want all my kids to go to church. Oh, that's wonderful. Let them go with you. It's wonderful. They, need, they don't need to, they need to go with you. And uh, because, you know, you can say whatever you want to say, but, and uh, I always told my boys not to drink out of the bottle, like a two liter bottle of soda or a milk jug. We don't drink out of the bottle. How many of y'all have ever told your kids that? A few of you. And so, I, you know, we don't do that. But every now and then, like they don't know the difference between the full jug and like the last little bit. So you say, don't do it. But if I get up and there's just a little bit of milk left, there ain't no need. And, and my wife, before she goes to bed, I mean, it's a ritual. That kitchen, there's going to be no dishes in the sink. Everything's going to be good. So I've learned, don't get up after that's happened and leave nothing, no evidence in the kitchen. But everybody likes a little snack at night, when you know. And so... You, but you can't leave any evidence. So my answer to that is, if there's only a little bit of milk in the jug, go ahead and finish it off. No need to mess up a good glass. Am I right about it? Yeah. Well, every now and then, the commotion has woke up a boy or two, and they'll come around the corner and see Daddy with that milk jug finishing it off. And so they don't understand. So really, it doesn't matter what you tell anybody. What do you do? What do you do? And so because God is faithful, we'll never say to God, God, you're not what you told me to be. Because he is faithful. And so he commands our faithfulness, but he can do so because he is faithful. And in the country of Armenia, 1988, um, a couple named Samuel and Danielle sent their son Armand to school. Samuel knelt down beside his son. He looked him in the eye and he said, have a, have a good day at school, son. He said, no matter what, I'll always be there for you. They hugged each other and the boy ran off to school. And hours later, a big earthquake rocked the area. In the midst of this pandemonium, uh, Samuel and Danielle tried to discover what happened to their son. Obviously, they were heartbroken. They wanted to get there as fast as they could. And so they couldn't get any information. The radio announced there was thousands of casualties. And this is, you know, 1988. So social media was not a, not a thing. And so they were trying to find out, you just like pulling teeth. They couldn't get anything out of anybody. And so Samuel grabbed his coat and headed for the schoolyard. That's the daddy. He's going after his son. And when he reached the area, he saw what he saw just Broke him down. He's crying. Brought tears to his eyes. Because Armand's school was just one big hump of, of debris. It was just nothing but rubble. And um, other parents were standing around just crying. So Samuel found a place. He looked at the, at the building. He found a place where his son's school, his classroom was. And so he started 
uh, he just went over there and, and he started just picking up stuff. He pulled this big beam off a pile of rubble. He grabbed a rock, put it to the side. Then he grabbed another rock, put it to the side. And one of the parents looked at him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm digging for my son. And the man said, well, you're just making things worse, man. He said, the building's unstable now. And he tried to pull Samuel away, but he wasn't going anywhere. And he set his jaw and just kept working. And uh, as time went on, one by one, the other parents left. Then a firefighter come up to him and, and to pull him away from the rubble. And Samuel looked at the firefighter and said, you're not going to help me? You're not going to help me? And uh, the firefighter left. Samuel kept digging. All through the night, in the next day, uh, Samuel continued digging. Rock by rock, by piece, by piece, by piece. And uh, parents had already placed flowers and pictures of their children on top of these ruins. Uh, all the rubble, he put stuff up. And Samuel kept working. He picked up a beam and pushed it out of the way. When he picked up this beam, pushed it out of the way, he heard a, a faint cry that said, help, help. And he listened, but he didn't hear anything. Then he heard a muffled voice, Papa. And he began to dig. Of course, he went into high gear now. And so he's digging furiously. But finally, he could see his son. He said, he said, come on out, son. Come on out with relief. And his son said, no. He said, let the other kids come out first because he said, I know you'll get me. I know you'll get me. He said, just let them other ones come out first. And child after child come out of the rubble. And uh, then Armand appeared and Samuel took him in his arms and, and Armand said, I told the other kids not to worry because you told me you'd always be there for me. Boy, 14 children that day were saved because one father was faithful. How much more faithful is our heavenly father? whether trapped by fallen debris or ensnared by life's hardships and struggles, we're never cut off from God's faithfulness. He's true to his character. He is reliable and trustworthy. What is the definition of God's faithfulness? God's faithfulness means that everything he says and does is certain. Everything God says and does is certain. He's 100% reliable 100% of the time. There's not a percentage of a chance that he's not going to be reliable every time. Not a percentage of a chance. He doesn't fail. He doesn't forget. He doesn't falter. He doesn't change. He doesn't disappoint. He says what he means, means what he says. And therefore, everything he says, he will do. And one writer compares the attributes of God, his love, his mercy, his justice with an automobile uh, engine and you got pistons, you got fan belts, you got water pumps and thousands of moving parts all swirl around within this small space. You got the whole engine working together and making power to drive the car. The parts all work together harmoniously um, to, you, together as a whole engine. They don't work in pieces, they work together. And you know, that's the way God's attributes function. If you took away love, God's character would be incomplete. God's love works together with the other attributes. You say, how can he be just and be loving? Because he's 100% perfectly loving, so he'll be 100% perfectly just. You, 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 there's no missing parts to God. If, if he was not 100% loving, then his justice would suffer. If his justice suffered, his love would suffer. But all parts are 100%. And it's almost like we can compare God's faithfulness to the oil that keeps the engine running. You got all these parts. But the stabilizing force behind all these parts, I mean, if you take the oil out, you have the parts, but you don't have a working engine. And if you take out the faithfulness of an almighty God, you may, you may see some attribute that's lovely over here or that's warranted over here. But unless the oil of God's faithfulness, unless the faithfulness of his character carries out the love, carries out the mercy, carries out the grace, displays the holiness, displays the justice, displays this faithfulness. Unless the faithfulness of God runs through 
all those parts are useless. But I'm glad we have a God that's not only loving, but he's not just loving sometimes. He's not only forgiving, he can forgive all the time. He not only loves sometime, he loves all the time. He not only forgives sometimes, he forgives all the time. God forgives, God loves, those are mainstays of his character. And because he is faithful, there's not a doubt in our mind that the love of God, the, the, uh, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God doesn't continually run in this life. They're always at work because God is faithful. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, we, we, we all can have a, a bad day. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It changes everything. I mean, you make a bad grade in school and your day's ruined. Somebody gives you a cross look and you're done for the day. I'm glad God is not, uh, he, he is not affected by causes outside of him. Causes outside of God's character does not determine his character. It doesn't even sway his character. God is faithful. If the world's falling apart, he's still faithful. If it's all working properly, he's still faithful because God's character is faithful. It's fluid. It never stops and it's not dependent on any causes outside of himself because he is self-existent. Because he is self-existent, he doesn't need anything else to happen or he doesn't need anybody else to grab a piece of this or a part of that or to do this or to do that. God is self-existent. Therefore, the only thing that depends on God's faithfulness is God himself and he has never failed nor will he ever fail. And because he is self-existent, he doesn't have to depend on anybody. So he doesn't say, well, I was going to get that to you today, but so-and-so Lost the keys to the delivery truck. We couldn't get it there on time. Oh no, there are no secondary components to God's character. God is self-existent. Therefore, he doesn't depend on anybody in the sense of keeping things together. I mean, this whole world, he's got rolling together just like he wants it. I mean, it consists because of him. It operates. I mean, just think if we were one, um, if we were just one small part closer to the sun we'd all burn up and if the earth was just one smidgen less close to the sun we'd all freeze God holds all that together he doesn't need any help I mean people think they're helping him scientists think they're helping him meteorologists think they're helping him they're not helping him He's self-existent. Therefore, he doesn't depend on anybody to be faithful. He's going to be dependent. He's going to be faithful to you because he is the only one that has to answer to him is him, God. He's self-existent. And I'm glad we serve a God that is, that is self-existent. I'm glad the causes around God does not determine who God is or what God does. Because it's his character to be faithful. And I'm glad it'd be one thing to say God was a God of love. Sometimes it'd be one thing to say God's a forgiving God sometimes. But that's not the case. He is always forgiving, always loving because he's always faithful. Lamentations 3 verse. Let's look at verse 1 just for a moment. Lamentations 3 verse 1. I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Jeremiah, he knows bad things are coming. Judgment's coming. He knows that. And he's, he's just really dreading what he knows is coming. Verse 10. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. In other words, I felt like God was getting ready to pounce on me. Dark, nobody's listening to the message. Worst times are coming. And he said, I didn't have any light whatsoever, any hope, not a glimmer of hope in sight, Jeremiah. Thus, he gets the name, the weeping prophet. Lamentations, a book of weeping. Verse 21. Then he has a revelation. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. That's why it's so important for us. We have to recall things about God. It's not, you know, like they used to have this hair gel called Dipty-Doo. 
And I think there's some others. Had one dab will do you, you know, like Grishon formula or something. One dab will do you. That's not true, but it was a good commercial. <laughs> Listen, in the, in the sense, everything is pulling us away from God. We have a cultural gravitational pull away from God. Social media is set up not to draw you closer to God, but draw you away from God. I don't think Zuckerberg created a tool so that it would get people closer to Jesus. That wasn't his intent. Now it can be used as, as such if you intend for it to. But there's, a, there's generally a, a, a pull away from God. So it's, it's, it's natural. It's going to happen. As long as we're in this flesh, we're going to have a natural drift. Just like an airplane pilot, if he didn't have a GPS and he, he was trying to use the tools that, that were given him in the, uh, in the plane, he would, he would uh, maybe a gyroscope, whatever, he'd have to reset things. He would have to, he would have to reset t- tools. It, they, they don't just reset themselves. He'd have to, he'd have to reset them. Just like a, a, a tuning fork. You got to reset some things, recalibrate. And you, you gotta you gotta do it. You gotta re, when, when things get out of tune, what do you gotta do? You gotta tune them. That gentleman comes up here. What's his name, Miss Carla? The guy that tunes up here, Don. Don Tuttle comes up here. He'll spend all day up here playing the piano. And and boy, I tell you, brother Timmy, I remember last time we had something else going on in the auditorium or something or somewhere around here, and Mr. Don was not very happy. Because there was some noise going on when he was trying to tune the pianos. So he went outside and just, he didn't say nothing. He just went outside and sit outside till we got done. And that was okay. <laughs> but he had to get it just right. But you know what? When does he come, Miss Carl? How often does he come? Twice a year. Twice a year. So I've been here. 10 years, so he's come at least 20 times since I've been here. You'd think one time would be enough. I mean, the, the wires are in there, right? It's pretty tough, durable material, but they get, they get out of tune. And different el- the elements uh, affect how much in tune. If you leave one out in the elements, you, you stand a greater chance it's going to get out of tune. The harsher the elements, the more out of tune it's going to get. And you and I, we have a natural tendency to drift. Our natural tendency is not to stay, to gravitate towards God. That's not the natural man's tendencies. The natural man's tendencies is to to drift. And so just like the tuning or just like the airplane, if you don't reset those directional tools and you get a, I mean, you, you get a true north reading. If you don't get a true north reading, you'll probably end up somewhere you never planned on ending up. Same way with our life. If we don't like Jeremiah, recall when he says, I brought this back to my mind. I mean, every single day, that's why it's so important to be in the word because we need to be reminded. We need to remind ourselves some things about God. And especially when things are going on so fast around us, we don't have a time to get out of the word. We don't have time to be distant from God. We don't have time to drift because if we do, we're going to wake up and be amazed at how far we drifted. I think we could say that about our nation. I mean, we've turned around twice and look where we're at. I mean, we're talking about going to be with a pastor because they're closing down his church. You can say what you want to. Everything else, I mean, they're operating just fine at other places. It's targeted. You're not going to make me believe it's not. And I'm not going to get into all that. I'm tired of hearing about COVID. I'm, I'm tired of hearing about it. I'm just going to be honest and forgive me, okay? But we drift. We drift. We've got to be recalibrated. How do you do that? By meditating on the reading, meditating. Just one quick glance is not going to get it. And some of you that's been saved for a long time, and uh, I know Miss Shelby, she's a charter member here. Boy, I appreciate charter members. How many charter members? I know Miss Roberta and them. Raise your hand if you're charter member. Oh, yes, we got several here. Charter members. 
And uh, that's a long time. 53 years, is that right? 53 years. 53 years. Did you know that the same Bible study Miss Martha had, let's just say 40 years ago, the same Bible study she had 40 years ago, the truths in the Bible are still good. But they have to be revisited. They have to be revisited. The Bible study, the people that heard the Bible study 40 years ago and the time that they had, and some of them may still be right here tonight. But you know what we got to do? We got to hear it again. We got to hear it again. Jeremiah said, I, I know better. I know that God's not sitting in the corner trying to pounce on me like a lion or a bear. And I understand I'm not all alone, but I sure feel like I'm all alone. He had to get his bearings straight. He had to get pulled back. He had to be tuned again. And you and I get the same way. We start drifting. We feel distant from God. We feel apathetic. We feel lethargic. We feel like God's not listening. We feel like God doesn't care. We feel like God's not interested in us. And we have to get back to the fact that I know God is self-existent. I know he's faithful. And I know the only thing that depends on God's faithfulness is God and he's never let me down. He's not going to start now. We have to be recalibrated. And that's why, you know, church every now and then is not going to do it. Bible study every now and then is not going to do it. We've got to be intentional about our reading, intentional about our studying, intentional about our gathering. Because we've got to recall the things that we know to be true about God to help us get through this evil day. He said, I recall, verse 21, to my mind, therefore, he said, when I do this, I have hope. Verse one, I'm the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Verse two, he wasn't thinking right. If Jeremiah, who could write this much of the Bible, could get us thinking off just for a minute, how prone do you think we are to do the same? Is it get our, get our mind off track? But he said, then when I recalled to mine, I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, I'm thankful for his faithfulness. It's almost like Jeremiah is saying, like, like somebody, a, a, a waiter is coming up to you all the time. God didn't have to stay, you know, he didn't have to stay awake to wait on us. But it's almost like this is a waiter just standing and watching. You know, a good waiter, a good waiter, that, that, that glass is not going to be empty. They may be in the back of the kitchen, but they got their eyes on that glass, I promise. A good one does. Now, the wrong kind's back there cutting up and telling jokes. But the good kind is peeking around that corner and they look, they're not looking at you. Don't get happy. They're looking at the glass. And you know, it's almost like God was saying, was, Jeremiah was saying, God's at our attention. He, he's, he's making sure that we don't run out of mercy at any time. Now, he's not going to run out of mercy. And he said they're new every morning. So there's no danger of him running out or you running out. But it's almost like he's at attention, making sure that he takes care of you. Why in the world should we worry and fret and worry about things and uh, get all tore up about things out of our control, about what we're going to do, what's going to happen here, where we're going to go, what in the world? we're going to do if this happens. Hey, all I know is I don't know how the parts are working, but I know they're working and I know who's working them. All I got to know is who's working them. And if I know God is working all the parts together, I can trust him. He's faithful and I don't have to worry about any of the parts failing because he never fails. See, we got to worry about pistons failing. We don't have to worry about that with God. There's no parts of his character. It's going to fail. Because the all of his character is fueled by faithfulness. The faithfulness of God. And I'm thankful. Thankful for his faithfulness. When does God's love fail? Never. Because he's faithful. When is God less than holy? Never. Because his character is pure and he's always faithful to who he is and to what he says. 
What does it mean that God is faithful? And I'm going to hurry through. Faithfulness, again, is a subset of God's immutability. That means God never changes. God never changes. He's unchangeable. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. You're not going to have that many generations. But yet God's going to be faithful to every one of them. I guarantee it. Psalm 102, 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Verse 26, they shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them and they shall be changed. But thou art the same and thy years shall have no end. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. James 3, 17 talks about full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And I'm glad that God can't change. God cannot change. If he could change in any way, he would have to change for the better. And that's impossible because he's already absolutely perfect. He's already perfect. So he can't change. He can't get any better than perfect. Or he would have to change for the worse. And that's not possible with absolute perfection either. So what makes God unchanging when we've already talked? You know, we change with a whim. We ch- our health changes. Fashion changes. The stock market changes. Feelings change. The government changes. God never changes. The one thing that we can say is absolutely the same as uh, previous generations. The generation that started this church. In 1967, the one common thread that we can say, God never changes. God has never changed. People will change. Things will change. God never changes. And again, he's self-existent. He's unchangeable because he's self-existent. In other words, the reason he's immutable is because he's self-existent. He doesn't depend on anything else to exist. So he's never going to change. God's free from all causes. And I just told you about that. Uh, you know, he's free, from, he's free from a cross look making him mad. He's free from knee jerk decisions. I mean, good night. If I get a little salad dressing on my tie or my shirt, I get upset. My wife really gets, oh, I'm just kidding. I hadn't had to worry about no salad dressing lately, I can tell you that. And uh, it gets upset. It, the littlest thing gets us upset. Aren't you glad God's not, he's not moved by any of that, by any little things. God's not moved. Moses said, who am I going to tell him? Like, we got to have a name here. Moses said unto God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Just tell them I am. I never change. What I was then, I'll be tomorrow. I am. When, whatever period of time you're telling them my name, you're going to be correct. Because I am. Self-existent. No limitations. Not affected by causes. And why does it matter that God is faithful? Without his faithfulness, you'll have very little testimony for the Lord. Without him being faithful, you'll not be faithful. You'll be plagued by sins you cannot overcome. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we preached about it Wednesday night. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. What, what is that verse? I mean, what is it hinging on? It's hinging on what? Our faithfulness? No, God's faithfulness to us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, faithful is he that calleth you, also he who also will do it. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, but the Lord is faithful, who will still establish you and keep you from evil. You may be, you may be unsure of your salvation without the faithfulness of God. If he can't forgive sins all the time, what makes you think he forgave you the first time? If his forgiveness capacity changes, what makes you think you're saved tonight? It doesn't change. First John 1, 9 was as good in May the 4th, 1986 as it is 
August the 23rd, 2020. He's faithful to forgive. And I'm thankful that his, that his faithfulness doesn't change. You know, we could be unsure of our salvation. We could be discouraged if God could change, easily discouraged by loneliness. But I'm glad Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What about our own failures? And we've talked a lot about that. 2 Timothy 2, 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He abideth faithful, whether you do or not, whether you are or I am or not, God abides faithful. Man, I've had people let me down. You've had people let you down, but I guarantee you there's one that's never let you down because he abided faithful. You may say, I let you down and I guarantee you have a possibility of being correct. And I may say, you let me down and I have a possibility of being correct, but you'll never raise your finger and say, he's not being faithful. Never. You won't even ever be able to say it. You ought not even ever think it. Because God abideth faithful. You won't be able to trust God without a clear view of his faithfulness. Psalm 37, 25. I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. We can trust him tonight because he's faithful. His promises will have little impact if you don't believe him to be faithful. How could Mary get so excited about giving birth to the Messiah? How should she get, how, how, did, how did that even mean anything to her? Because of the promise of God. And she believed the promise of God because she had been told. She believed it. Why did she believe it? Because God had proven himself faithful. The promises of God mean very little to you if you cannot believe in the faithfulness of God. And Mary said in, John, in Luke 146, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Verse 47, my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. Why'd you get excited about that? Because it was a promise that was fulfilled. Why is Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. How can we hold this Bible tonight and know that it's the word of God because of the faithfulness of God? Because what he said to Abraham is true. What he said to David is true. What he said to Joseph, the promises he made to Joseph, the promises he made to Mary is true. The promises he made all through the Old Testament into the New Testament is true. If I... Go away, I will come again. I will come again. He's coming again. How do we know his promises are true? Because he is faithful and true. Every promise hinges on the oil of faithfulness throughout the scripture. And I, you can't nick away and chip away at the promises of God because you will not be able to chip away and nick away at the faithfulness of God because he is faithful, because he is immutable, he never changes. We can hold on to the steady hand of God and know that what he said in his word is true. It was true in no Noah's day, it'll be true in our day. And when Jesus comes back, we'll know it's true. It's true because God is faithful. Amen. You see, all these things are fuzzy in my mind. I don't know what to believe. Trust God. He's faithful. Quit leaning to your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge what about him? I acknowledge Jesus. Acknowledge his faithfulness. Amen. How do you acknowledge his faithfulness? You acknowledge his faithfulness when you say, I don't, it doesn't matter what comes in November, what comes in December, what happens in January because of November. God is faithful. If they find a vaccine, God is faithful. If they don't find a vaccine, God is faithful. If they find a vaccine and you don't want to take the vaccine, God is faithful. Because I got my doubts about that. But guess what? Doesn't matter. God is faithfulness. 
God's character is not changed because of what he sees on this planet. He's stable. He's steadfast. He's not nodding. He's not even nervous. Because he's faithful. He's faithful. And that's why what bothers me when I see God's people so fearful. Because it's an indictment. On the faithfulness of God. It's calling into question. God's faithfulness. I'm not talking about running out to the street and saying God hold the cars back. I'm talking about just being on edge of, of, of fright and fear. Fear is not of the Lord. You'll not find one verse that validates fears from God. Not one. Except if you're talking about a reverential awe of God, now that then you're on the right track. But fear of anything else, not biblically, not biblically backed for any any of that. I can stand no matter what's happening, no matter what's going to happen, no matter what I know is going to happen, what I don't know is going to happen. How many of y'all predicted what would happen in 2020? Anybody? Yeah, nobody. You know the only person in this building that it didn't take by surprise? God. God. And COVID didn't even upset God's faithfulness. God has not being not stopped being faithful because of COVID. He's not had to put up any signs. Amen. These are these are COVID restrictions. We're operating under COVID circumstances. Aren't you glad God didn't have to put up any signs? He didn't have I don't see any COVID exemptions here in the Bible anywhere. I don't see any addendums. It's got the COVID addendum 2020. Oh no. He's faithful. 1920 or 2020. God is faithful. Boy, we need to lean heavy. Lean heavy on his faithfulness. And let me let's read, let's read some of Lamentations and I'll be done. So I, that's such a good scripture. I've given you plenty, but we haven't stayed right here much. Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Can you say that tonight? The Lord is my portion. When you get a portion, you may get a bowl of soup or something. You say, this is my portion. This is mine. What does that mean when you say this is my portion? That means that you're not going to eat mine. That means that you're not going to go savage and start eating off of my plate. You know why? Because you're looking at this bowl and saying this portion, this is enough for me. I don't need to go swiping your crackers or digging in. You know how some people, it's rude to eat off of other people's plate. Let me just tell you that. Unless it's you and your wife or y'all got a thing worked out, you, you work it out. Don't always work as good as you think it might. When you say this is my portion, if me and Brother Joel were sitting down to eat and I, I gave him a plate, he gave me a plate, I gave him the same amount that I have. Well, I love Brother Joel and I hope he loves me. And if he asked me for my plate, you know what I'd do. I've done it for my kids, you've done it for your kids. If you see something's not equal in the food department, you're going to say, here, here's your nothing, go get it. And you ain't even eat yet. Y'all know how to do that. You've all done it. But if, if he asks me for my plate, I'm going to give him my plate. And if I ask him for his plate, I think he might would give it to me if, it's, if I've been a good pastor. But I, I don't really want him just reaching over and start poking on my food with his hands. After I just made him his plate. That's his portion. You know, God doesn't want you poking around in any other sustainable thing to try to have your needs met. You know why? Because he said, I have the Lord as my portion. And guess what? It's enough. You don't have to go getting plan B and C and D and E and fretting all night till you got ulcers galore. The Lord, he's our portion. 
And guess what? He's enough. He's enough. His faithfulness is enough.